Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. Why don't you open your Bibles with me to Isaiah 55. Thanks, man. Now, if you're good, I'll only keep you for the normal amount of time that I keep you. (laughs) Sounds like a deal, huh? (laughs) Isaiah 55, and I'm going to be reading verses 10 and 11. God says, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Okay. God says here that just like the snow, just like the rain when it falls down on the earth, it's not going to evaporate until it has accomplished its purpose in falling on the earth. It's not going to go back up into the sky until it has accomplished its purpose of watering the earth so that plants can grow and and all of that. Um, He says that just like that, that's how my word works. Um, This is the word of God, but it's not the whole word of God. It is not the embodied word of God, if I have to say that. I, I can't just say that this is all that comes out of God's mouth, but what comes out of God's mouth will never, ever contradict what is in here. Um, if, if it does, it didn't come out of God's mouth. It came out of yours and maybe your rear end. I don't know. Um, sometimes I feel that way about prophetic words. I'm just saying some, some prophetic words, I'm like, ah, that was not God's mouth at all. That was something else. Um, but he says in verse 11, he says, this will be the same way my word works. Everything that comes out of my mouth will not return to me empty. He just says it won't. It will not return to me empty. The word empty here means without effect. He says, it's not gonna return to me without effect. Now, in order for my word to return to me, he says, it has to have an effect. It cannot return to me until it has accomplished its purpose. Now, this doesn't mean that everything God says to us, we do, all right? God says things to us sometimes and tells us to do things that we just decide, I don't wanna do that, all right? What he's saying here is not that every time he speaks, you know, it just automatically happens. What he's saying is it can't return to me unless it has an effect. It can't come back to me unless it accomplishes its purpose. So the goal of the word of God is not to just be sown or to be spoken. It's to eventually go back to him. That's the goal. He doesn't just want the words that come out of his mouth to just fall onto the ground or fall into our hearts and that's it. He wants what he speaks to come back to him. That's the goal. I believe that. Why does he want his word to return to him? It's like the troops coming home from war. It's the same thing. When the troops come home from war, what does it mean? Mission accomplished, right? So when God's word returns to him, that's what it means, mission accomplished. 
It accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish. What kind of farmer plants a seed that he has no intention of harvesting later? That, that wouldn't make sense at all. You ever seen a farmer plant a seed and he walks away from it and he's like, I don't really care about what happens with that thing. I just felt like planting a seed. No, the farmer wants this thing to grow so that he can harvest it later, right? He wants it to grow. This is how God is with his word. He wants his word to have an effect on us so that it can return to him. He wants his word to have an effect on us and an effect on the earth so that he can harvest it, so that he can reap the harvest. And what does it say, I think, in, in Hebrews? It says, Hebrews, God is not mocked. <laughs> Whatever you sow, you will reap. This is, this is God's intention. Whatever I sow, I plan on reaping. That's what he wants. Whatever I sow with my word, I plan on reaping. Basically, God wants a return on his investment. Sounds pretty fair, right? All right, let's turn to Mark chapter four. <clears throat> Mark chapter four, and I'm gonna read verses one through 20. All right, Mark 4, 1 through 20 says, he began to teach again by the sea, this is Jesus, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this, behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers along with the 12 began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. So that while seeing, they may see and not perceive, and while hearing, they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately, Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. There's a lot there, but I want to go through a little bit of this. Look at verse 14. It says, the sower sows the word. Okay? If the sower sows the word, who's the sower? It'd have to be God, right? Words coming out of his mouth we just even read in Isaiah 55. Every word that comes out of my mouth will not come back to me without effect. Right? God is the sower and he sows the word. Now, this is actually referring to the word of God in a general sense, I believe. I think that there are obvious connotations to the gospel here, that when the gospel is sown into our hearts, these are, this is basically showing us pictures of what can happen based on how we receive the gospel. But I wanna tell you something about the gospel. The gospel has to be the whole word. It has to be. It has to be. 
through the whole word. The gospel is not separate from the word. The word is the gospel, the gospel is the word, okay? So whenever this says that the sower sows the word, I do believe that it's talking about God's word in general. Every word that comes out of his mouth, everything that he speaks, everything that he says, everything that is in here, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? Um, the gospel is more than just salvation. It's just the good news of a good God. That's in my opinion. Now, what this whole thing, this whole parable, makes it sound like, first of all, let me say that the soil that these seeds are being sown into is our heart. The heart is the soil, all right? And it makes that very clear in here. The heart is the soil. The seed is the word, the heart is the soil. And this parable makes it sound like people have a predetermined type of soil. Like you've got, you either have rocky soil, thorny soil, um, you're beside the road where the seed's being sown, or you're good soil, right? And depending on what type of soil you are is how you're going to receive the word. I don't believe that. I believe that the way it actually works, and I think we can see that in the way it's worded, is not that you are already a, a certain type of soil, but that how you respond to the word makes you a type of soil. All right? So you can't just assume if you didn't receive the word, well, I must be rocky soil then or something like that, or I must be thorny soil because I, I, I I'm, I'm not receiving that or the world must be thorny soil because they're not receiving the word. No, it all comes down to how I choose to receive it and how I, what I choose to do with it that ultimately decides what type of soil I am. Now, what this means is that the soil of the heart actually adapts to the treatment of the word. It will actually adapt to the treatment of the word. I want you to remember that because it's gonna come up later. Look at verse 15. He starts explaining the different types of soil here. And the first type is the soil that is beside the road where the seed is being sown. In verse 15, he says, these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. Basically what's going on here is there's a certain path. The road would be the path in which the seed's being sown where the seed is supposed to be sown. And he says that there is a type of soil, a type of heart that is beside the road where the seed's being sown. So basically this soil is not directly in line or directly underneath the sowing of the word. Instead, what actually happens is as the sower is sowing along this road, some seeds kind of scatter and fall onto the sides. And this seed that scatters and kind of accidentally falls onto the sides where that soil is, they get kind of little bits and pieces of what is being sown. But they're not directly underneath the funnel of the word, okay? This is a picture literally of people who kind of just accidentally find themselves hearing the word. It's just an accident or... Um, yeah, this soil either accidentally receives God's word or just gets bits and pieces here and there. So how do we become this type of soil? Because this is important. It's not whether you are a type of soil, it's how you become that type of soil based on how you treat the word. How do you, be, how do you become the type of soil that is actually beside the road? I believe that you become this type of soil by not intentionally placing yourself in a position to receive his word. You have to intentionally, on purpose, put yourself in a place to receive his word if you wanna get the most out of it. If you don't intentionally put yourself there, you're the soil beside the road and just gonna kind of accidentally pick up on some stuff here and there, all right? So what does this look like? You know, you might encounter somebody who's like, well, God just hasn't talked to me in a really long time. And then they say, I haven't been to church in a long time. Well, maybe you should go to church. <laughs> Intentionally put yourself in a place 
where you can receive the word. Put yourself there on purpose and you'll hear his voice. Put yourself in your closet on purpose, wherever it is that you hear him. Put yourself, um, put some worship music in your ears or something, put, just do it on purpose. A lot of people feel like they can't hear God because they're, they're, in all reality, what they're doing is that they're just kind of avoiding their, their role in actually receiving it. Like God's not talking to me anymore. No, you're just nowhere that he's talking. You stop going to church long enough, you will stop hearing him, I promise. This is a place where we can intentionally put ourselves just in a place to receive his word and to hear him, amen? The people that that joined David's tent this year and last year, what are they doing? They're intentionally putting themselves in a place to receive God's word, to hear him, because that's what it's about. Now, this is interesting. Look at verse nine, speaking of hearing. Verse nine, he says, and he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. (laughs) You know what this tells me? That it's never a matter of whether God is speaking. It's only a matter of whether I'm hearing. Let he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Pretty simple. Your grandpa ever say that to you? I can't hear it, grandpa. Well, you got ears, don't you? That might or might not be something my grandpa said to me. <laughs> but this, just, this tells me, if Jesus is saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, why would Jesus say that if God wasn't speaking? If God wasn't speaking, it'd be like, hear what? But he says, let him hear. It's never a matter of whether God is speaking. It's only a matter of whether I'm hearing him. Amen? Amen? Now look at verses 16 and 17. It says, in a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. This is comical to me, verse 17, and comical to me in kind of a, kind of a dark way, I guess, (laughs) because it says that when persecution, when persecution arises because of the word, it says because of the word. This doesn't pull any punches and directly flat out blames the word for persecution. (laughs) It's comical to me like I said, in kind of a dark way, because it's persecution, you know, affliction. But it's comical to me that Jesus would say, listen, the persecution, the affliction that you're experiencing, it's because of what I put inside of you. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> why, why would this happen? Everything in the world wants to resist God. Everything. Everything in the world wants to resist God. When God plants a seed of his word inside of me, I automatically become something that is resistant to the world. And if I am resistant to the world, the world is resistant to me. When you choose to become a believer, I mean, it's the most basic level of receiving the word of God. When you choose to become a believer, you are choosing to make yourself an enemy to the world. You are. You can't be a friend to the world anymore. You're not on their side. This is why the word says resist the devil, not assist the devil. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Anytime God puts something in me, you better believe this too. If he ever speaks something to you, you're going to be tried on it. You're going to be tested on it. Not because God is testing you, but because the world is testing you. Because everything that you encounter in life, in the world, is going to resist what God just deposited in you. You think, well, God is testing me right now. No. He deposited something in you that is being tested. Are you going to hold fast to that thing that he put inside of you? The word says this. I mean, in other gospels of this, this parable right here, he who holds fast to it. 
It's not just something that's gonna sit in there. I'm gonna hold on to this thing, this word that you gave me, God, this promise that you spoke over me, this lesson that you taught me, I'm gonna hold on to it. How many of you have ever, I don't know how many of you have preached before, but, or if you've ever ministered to someone just one-on-one, how many of you have ever ministered to somebody and then like the very next day, you're experiencing what you ministered to them on? Like, don't ever teach on patience. (laughs) But you know what it is, really, though? There are always opportunities to be impatient. But when a seed of patience is planted in you, it makes you aware of patience. And when you become aware of the word of God inside of you, when you become aware of the word of God inside of you, all of a sudden you're aware of what's not the word because of what's inside of you. So it's not God testing us with those things, it is what is inside of us being tested. And I think that this is actually how people become hardened in their heart. And I think this is why it calls this soil rocky soil. Because if you don't understand that what God puts inside of you is for your better and for your good, then you become bitter at God because every time he puts something inside of you, you all of a sudden start experiencing all these problems. And it's not because God made these problems happen. It's because there is something in you now that is worth resisting. The world finds worth resisting. And I think people over time kind of get bitter they harden their heart toward the word of God. They're like, I don't want any more because every time you put some, every time you promise me something, every time you speak something over my life, I get tested, I get tried, I get persecuted. You become rocky soil. It's like you initially received it, but then trial and persecution come and you're like, I don't want this anymore. Right? Know this. God's not gonna put something inside of you, put a seed inside of you, put his word in you or speak his word over your life unless he knows that you can resist the persecution that will come because of it. He doesn't always seem fair, but he is. Right? All right, look at verses 18 and 19 now. Verse 18 says, and others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. There are three things here that that he mentions can choke the word. And whenever it says choke the word, it literally is a picture of these things coming and choking the word the word. What happens to someone's voice when you choke them? It's, you can't speak when you're being choked. So these thorns that it's talking about actually prevent the word of God from being heard. Like it, it prevents it from speaking into your life. Not that something is choking God, but whatever God has deposited in you, that word that he has, he has spoken over your life it will silent it will become silent because of these things and there are three things here that he mentions he says first of all the worries of the world worries of the world this translates to literally anxiety about things pertaining to this life anxiety about things pertaining to this life a lot of people are driven by the worries of the world the anxiety of things pertaining to this life. Going back to what Pastor April just said during the offering, we have a lot of things that we could be anxious about right now, right? Now, whenever we become anxious about things pertaining to this life, it silences what God said to us. Why would becoming anxious about things pertaining to this life silence what God says. Well, anxiety is also a voice. It is a voice that is the opposite of God's. 
And what anxiety does is it steals away our trust in God and it actually steals it and uses it for its own good, for its own gain. That's what anxiety does. Anxiety is just trust in the wrong thing. It's trust in something that actually cannot hold you up. It is impossible to become anxious when your trust is totally in God because he is capable of carrying you. If you place your trust in something that cannot carry you, that's when you become anxious. If you feel like the answer is always more money, then the answer will always be more money. When you get more money, it's still your answer. Why? Because it was your answer before. When you get more money, you're gonna want more money, and you're gonna want more money, and you're gonna want more money. What do you think happens? The same thing happens when your trust is in God, when, you're God, when God is your answer. What happens when God is your answer? You're gonna want more God, and you're gonna want more God, you're gonna want more God, you're gonna want more God, right? So this is why the worries of the world can actually choke that word. It can literally take, if God said, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm speaking financial provision over your life and you're anxious about money, you are allowing your trust in money to dominate what could be your trust in God and letting him actually take care of what he told you he was gonna take care of. And, and you'll literally just forget what he said. You just won't be able to hear it. It says the deceitfulness of riches is the second thing, the deceitfulness of riches. Not riches, the deceitfulness of riches, all right? I can't condemn somebody for being rich, okay? Some people are rich because they're smart. Some people are rich because they're spoiled, right? I can't condemn somebody for being rich, but this says the deceitfulness of riches. And this literally means that I am being, like we talked about last week, I am being led by money. I am being led by wealth. And more appropriately, I am being misled. That's what it means to be deceived. You're being led, but it's in the wrong direction. That's what it means to be misled, right? Now, the deceitfulness of riches then means that it's a pursuit of wealth that looks like it could be a good thing, but you're being misled. My pursuit is not, it should never be for wealth. I should never be in pursuit of just wealth for the sake of wealth. That's, that's deception. Because my pursuit is not for anything on this earth. My, my pursuit is for him up there. That's, that's what I care about. That's my number one. And then it says, this, this is kind of funny too, it says the desires for other things. You know what this means, literally? Desires for everything else. <laughs> Just everything else, go ahead and lump it in there. I wonder if Jesus was talking and he was like, uh, what's the first one? He says, the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and he was like, oh, just all of it, really. <laughs> desires for anything, anything but his kingdom, ultimately. The word says, seek first his kingdom, and all these things will be added to you, right? If I am not seeking first his kingdom, and I'm seeking first these things, I will not hear his kingdom when it speaks, right? You hear me? All right. And then verse 20 says, and those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil, and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30, 60, and 100-fold. What is it that makes you good soil? What is it that makes my heart good soil? It's when I hear the word and accept it. Not just hearing the word, but also accepting it. The word accept here means to admit, but not to admit entrance, to admit to be true. Okay, that's what it means. I not only hear the word, but I decide, I admit it, it's true, it's right. 
this is important because just like Pastor April was ta- also kind of talking about what happened in David's tent yesterday, one thing that I teach in David's tent is that really hearing the voice of God comes down to the fact that you are by nature closer to him than you've ever been before. By your nature, you are closer to him than you've ever been before. And because you are closer to him than you've ever been before, you are more likely to hear his voice than you aren't. So what I teach is typically, as soon as you ask God to to give you a word, just say the first thing that comes to your mind. Now, you might think, well, that's really dangerous. I think it's more dangerous to skip over the first thing because we think it wasn't God and to try and conjure something up. Word says, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. You are his sheep, you hear his voice. When you ask God a question, you better believe he's not gonna wait around. He's gonna answer you. That's what I even believe an answered prayer is. It's not when God does what you tell him to do. The answered prayer is when God talks to us after we talk to him, (laughs) right? So I really truly believe that when it comes to hearing the word of God, you are in the best position you could be, seated with him in heavenly places, I mean right next to him. You think you're seated with him in heavenly places and you're miles away from him? You're, You're right next to him. You better believe that when he speaks, you're gonna hear that voice. I mean, you can hear the voice of the person sitting right next to you right now pretty well. That, that should be as well as you can hear God. You just have to believe it. So what makes us good soil, though, is when we hear his word, we hear him speaking to us, and we admit that's the truth right there. But we don't always want to admit that that's the truth, especially when what he speaks to us sounds too good to be true. Have you ever had God give you a word that sounds too good to be true and it's so too good to be true that you almost convince yourself that it couldn't be God? You ever gotten a word like that before? If God told you right now, if God said, I want you to have a million dollars, would you believe him? Probably laugh, be like, that wasn't God. God doesn't want me to have a million dollars. How do you know? What if it was him? You just missed it. Sometimes God will say things to us that sound almost too good to be true, and they're so too good to be true, we convince ourselves that that wasn't God, and we skip over it. It affects the soil of our hearts. We can't admit that what God just said to us is true. Like we're, we're painting a different picture of God rather than just letting him decide which type of soil he wants us to be. Painting a picture of God ahead of time rather than just allowing his word to penetrate the depth of our soil and and change who we are. So I not only hear the word, but I also admit it. It's true. And what that does is it causes, causes me to bear fruit. That's what it says. You know what happens when you bear fruit? It means what God spoke to you is about to return to him. That's what it means. We just read in Isaiah 55 earlier, whatever God speaks isn't gonna go back to him unless it's had an effect. So what ultimately the effect of a seed is, of sowing a seed, is a harvest. That's the result. And that's the result God is looking for. This says that when I hear the word of God, when I hear his voice and I admit that is true, I believe that, I'm standing by that, I'm sticking to that, and I'm not gonna let the enemy convince me that it's a lie. This is the truth. I become good soil, and then I bear fruit. Now, just to close this out, I wanna talk about what fruit is. We've talked in the past about this, and I firmly believe this, that fruit is actually not deeds, it is character. I believe that. I believe that fruit is not deeds, it is character. I believe deeds are the result of character. But character is fruit, okay? Um, I, I firmly believe that, I really do. But I, I, I also believe something else that I wanna share with you. 
Turn with me to Hebrews 13 real quick. Hebrews 13. While you're turning there, I'm going to bring up something that I already said in worship. Um, It's one thing when somebody else leads worship and preaches your your sermon. It's another thing when you lead worship and you preach your sermon. Um, But I already said this in worship. Paul, at, at one point, is writing to the Corinthians, and they're very divided against each other. And uh, a lot of what's going on is there are factions forming based on who taught them. Some were of Paul, some were of Apollos. If you read in the book of Acts, I don't remember what chapter it is, maybe 22. Um, if you read in the book of Acts, can't be that chapter. Paul goes to Ephesus and he preaches the gospel And he plants a seed of the word of God inside the people that he was talking to. And it says later on, Apollos goes to the same church. And when Apollos begins teaching, he's he's still teaching kind of old stuff. And so Priscilla and Aquila have to take him aside and be like, that's not what we teach anymore. It's, It's different now. And right there, Apollos becomes awakened to the gospel, the truth about Jesus Christ. And then it says after that, he begins teaching the truth about Jesus Christ. So what happened is Paul, whenever Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he says, we're all, basically says this, we're all just servants, obedient servants to God, doing whatever it is that he tells us to do. He says, I planted and Apollos watered, but it's God who's causing the growth. That's what he says. I planted, but Paulus watered. It's God's God who causes the growth. Now, listen, if a plant doesn't get water, is it going to grow? Right? A plant needs water, but does it say God watered the plant? God caused the growth. In other words, there is no life outside of God. <laughs> There is no life outside of God's. He caused the growth, but it doesn't say God watered it. It says one man planted, the other man watered. Now, here's what what happened, though. When Paul originally preached the gospel at Ephesus, that's what he did. You know what he preached on? The truth about Jesus Christ. Apollos comes back later. You know what he preaches on? The truth about Jesus Christ. Paul planted, Apollos watered. What were they saying? The same thing. It's just the one who did it first is the one who planted. The one who did it after him, repeated it, is the one who watered, right? Hold on to that. Hebrews 13, verse 15. says, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Fruit is character, but there is some fruit here that is different. The fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. This is the sacrifice of praise. It gives a definition for the sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. I want you to know, this isn't saying, this isn't talking about the fruit of our lips, This is saying the fruit is our lips. Okay? Are you with me? In other words, this isn't the result of our lips. This is saying that our lips is the result of something else. It's not the fruit of our lips. It's it's that the fruit is our lips. And I know it says the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name, But this is just saying this is what the fruit consists of. Lips that give thanks to his name. This is the fruit. Okay. 
This says, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Here's what's amazing. What does it mean to give thanks to his name? Well, right here it says, give thanks. The words give thanks literally mean to agree. Or, or more specifically, the words give thanks literally mean to say the same thing. To say the same thing. As, as who? This is what I believe. This is the fruit that I believe God wants. This is the return on his investment. It's the sacrifice of praise. It's the lips that repeat what has been spoken to them. It's the lips that repeat and deposited them. God says something to you and you say it back. It is literally his word returning to him. Most of the time, though, we, we find it hard to say it unless we've seen it, <laughs> right? We find it hard to say it like if God promises us something. Sometimes it's hard to actually declare it unless we've seen it. But you know how God's word has had an effect? What's the evidence of his word having had an effect? It being returned to him. I'm telling you that if you want what has been spoken into your life to have an effect, you need to speak it yourself. Say the same thing. Just say it, speak it out. Let it return to him, because he said it's not gonna come back to me unless it has accomplished what it was sent out to accomplish. I give him that fruit, that sacrifice of praise, and it's so interesting. The sacrifice of praise is then based on what has been deposited in us. The sacrifice of praise is based on what has been spoken to us if giving thanks to his name means saying the same thing. Right? So what this means is that if you've ever heard God before, if you've ever heard him speak to you before, you have a testimony to release. And I firmly believe something. This kind of came out on Wednesday. But there is something to the testimony. Something about the testimony that is going to stir up something. Specifically in our city, I firmly believe it. I think, I don't remember exactly what came out, but it was something about having an attraction or a, an attractiveness to it. That when the testimony is heard, it's going to draw many. When the testimony is released, it's going to draw many. People don't need to hear you tell them that they're going to hell. I think they actually need to hear you tell them that you're going to heaven. Yes. I believe that. I don't know if people need you to tell them that they're going to hell. I think they need you to tell them that you are going to heaven. Look what I got. Right? Look what I have. I think the world's kind of over that. They're not responding to it anymore. I don't, I don't know if they did ever, honestly, but, but I know they aren't now. But you know what they do respond to? They respond to things that people enjoy, that people love things that people are attracted to. Have you seen those videos of where people will, I mean, it's like a flash mob video where they form like a random line, like out in the middle of the sidewalk or something, and they see how many people walking by will just get in line even though they don't know what's, what they're getting in line for? Have you seen those videos before? They're hilarious. And people are just standing in line. They don't know what they're standing in line for, but they'll stay there forever. Nothing ever happens. This is what, I feel like the world wants to see a bunch of people standing in line. <sighs> like, show me something that's attractive. Give me something that, that, that's, that's good for me. Give me something that looks good, that smells good, that sounds good. Give me a God that is good. 
not just a God that wants to punish me, but a God that loves me. And you gotta know, like, I, I know some of you might be thinking, Josh, you need to balance that out. Like, you can't just say God loves people because he hates sin. Well, sin and people are two different things, all right? And you know how God hates sin? By loving people. You know how God destroys sin? By forgiving it. <laughs> so what, what we need to get in the habit of doing is we've been talking lately about bringing to remembrance the things that God has spoken to us over the years. If you've taken notes or something about things that God spoke to you or you've, you've written down prophetic words that he's given you, pull those things out, begin to speak them out. Let them return to him. Let them go back to him. Give them to him in praise. You might feel like I haven't seen this happen yet, but I can pretty much guarantee you that if you begin declaring those things over your life, you'll see them happen. Because God said it can't come back to me until it's accomplished what I sent it out to accomplish. Right? And I, I brought up all the different types of soil because we need to make sure that when God speaks to us that we're receiving it the way it needs to be received. We hear it, not only hear it, but we admit it, it's true. What you just said to me is true. It's real. It's not a lie. And not, it's not going to maybe happen. <laughs> what you said to me is true, and I admit to it. And you speak it out. Amen? All right, why don't you stand with me? Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.